All right. Off to you, Caitlin. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Caitlin. Um, you might know me as Caterbug or Caterbug Studios on other platforms. Um, I am working with Art Snacks right now to uh, teach you guys some classes um, using the quarterly subscription. So welcome to today's class. We're going to be learning some processes in um, negative space and reduction. And what I like about both of these things is that they both require you to kind of turn your brain around and think about drawing like differently than you normally do. So they're a really good uh, thing to learn together. And the uh, in this month's box are perfect for learning these techniques. So let's get to it. We can go ahead and go to our top down view. Um, on Mix, I do have a um, article posted with some visual aids. Um, I, I will have everything I'm using here on screen, but if you wanted to uh, pull up your phone um, to have like a better view or just to have it in a better place while you're drawing um, or to reference later, if maybe you're watching um, the stream on the go, um, then you can look at this later. So this first one, I'm going to be um, talking about negative space and you can really use any pencil, sketching pencil um, you want. And uh, I'm just using the uh, drawing pencils that came in this month's box, uh, but you can use the mechanical pencils as well. And what negative space is talking about is like all of these little, um, little like wooden tokens, all of these are positive space, like the object is the positive space and the space behind it is the negative space around those objects. And so when you're thinking about drawing the negative space, you're thinking about dr like drawing this shape, which I can just draw directly on this, which maybe I don't have a good, I'll use my pastels to show you, but you're going to be drawing this space. And it helps you like think about drawing just a little bit differently. And it, it gives you a tool to approach drawing from a, like from a, a reference photo or from life a little bit differently. Um, so I'm just going to show you how I would approach drawing this um, like with positive space versus negative space. So first, like, so if I was drawing this with positive space, I would put in like a horizon line, which really you can do this with either technique. And then positive space, I would be looking at like, okay, what shapes are here to draw? And there's kind of like some basic triangle shape with the ball at the top. So and there's also like so many different ways you can capture this with like, oh, the, the contour, like the outline of the object, or are you drawing it, you know, the shading and all that kind of stuff. Um, so just go with whatever feels right to you. I'm kind of doing like a outline contour drawing. So we have like, that would be the positive space. And I know that that's a little bit light for you guys to see. And then on this side, if I'm thinking about the negative space, I'm going to start kind of filling in this background to reveal the shape of the object. So you're more thinking about following that line of the background. And this can be something that is really helpful if maybe you're having trouble with like um, making sure something's proportionate. Sometimes when you're looking at an object to draw uh, and you're only following the outline, and I know that that's like the lighting's a little bit weird on that for you guys. Um, proportion can be hard sometimes when you're only looking at the positive space and then looking for clues in the negative space can help you out a lot. So 
Um, right now, I'm just using this technique to block in and uh, just kind of show you guys, because I'm going to be talking about the negative space a lot later um, in the stream. And I just wanted you guys to have a good idea of what I was talking about when we're talking about drawing the positive space versus the negative space. Um, and this is a really fun picture if you want to go back and like practice your shading with it later as well. Um, so I'm going to pause on this for a bit and talk about something a little bit different, um, which is reduction. And reduction techniques are going to be where you fill in a background with a media, like our pan pastels, and then you are using an eraser to draw. And uh, so reduction, you think about reducing the media that's on it. Um, so I'm just going to start filling in, um, a, just a line. And before we jump into like a full drawing, I just want, um, you can take some time to practice what it's like going to be removing this particular media. So, um, if you've done this before with like graphite or charcoal, everything is going to lift a little bit differently. Um, so before you jump into your drawing, you will want to get a good idea of how this is going to lift with the eraser that you're using. Um, and I think a good thing to do is to just create like a, like a bar here. And we're going to do a little bit of a value scale and try to get this all a consistent color. It doesn't have to be perfect, but you'll want it more consistent. And I find that laying this down in like a uh, kind of thinner um, strokes to build it um, works better for me. And although I still manage to pick up a little bit too much product sometimes because I'm a little heavy handed that so. Um, but the idea is now that I have this swatch of color that your uh, that this is going to be like the black of your drawing. It's going to be the darkest on the value scale. And so now we want to keep the dark over here, but we want to lighten it up over here. And if if you want to, you can kind of trace out like the, the ends. Um, and I'm using the kneaded eraser that came in the box for this. So we can think about this as the end. And so we're just going to want to try to lighten this up and have it go gradually from dark to light. And something about this kneaded eraser, especially a new one, is that it's going to pick up a lot of product. And so you just want to get an idea of what that's going to be like. And as you use it, you can uh, you clean a kneaded eraser just by kneading it in your hands. Um, and so what you'll see is that you can kind of like pick some up. And then that spot's going to become, in this case, purple. Um, and it's not going to really pick up as much on that part that you just used. So you're going to want to move around your eraser or switch to a different, um, or, or, or knead it so it, it cleans it off. So move it around as you use it um, or uh, clean it. But when you're starting to get to these mid-tones where you don't want it to be completely light, be, yeah, be completely light, then um, using these parts of the eraser that already have some product on it are going to be your friend because you're not going to want to pick up all of that because you want it to be gradual from light to dark. Um, so we're just going to keep working on this for a little bit and practice before we move on to a composition um, with your reduction techniques and using negative space. And your hands are going to get a little bit messy with these um, pan pastels, but I find that using the eraser, like it actually kind of like cleans it off of your hands a little bit because it's a little tacky. Um, so I'm just pulling the eraser towards the dark side.
And you can always go back in and like fill in this mid mid area. But I would say as much as you can um, try to get it without needing to come back and add more product. Just trying to get this as close to the paper color as possible on this side. And now I'm kind of using that technique of having some of the pastel on the eraser to kind of blend this area in the middle. So now we have a nice gradual scale there. Um, and these uh, pastels, I think you can also use other erasers on it um, as well. So. Uh, I don't think they'd work exactly the same as the techniques I'm using here with the kneaded one, but I would definitely give it a try, um, especially if maybe you're uh, look like looking for a certain uh, shape or um, uh, like I have this eraser that has like really tiny edges, um, but it's not going to behave exactly the same as this. So it's definitely something you're going to want to try to test out beforehand on a little test sheet like this. Um, but you can start to get really interesting shapes with your kneaded eraser and you can put it like squeeze it to a really fine point and then be able to um, use it a little bit more like um, a drawing tool. And so I'm going to show you that here and just create another little square of solid color. All right, so there's my solid color. And there's a lot on here right now um, because I just put it down. So I have a little bit of excess on top. So I'm just gonna go ahead and scoot my kneaded eraser over it a little bit just to pick up some of that. And then um, initially when you're starting to remove color, um, it's going, you're gonna take off a lot at one time um, so I like to kind of stamp the kneaded eraser over in an area um, to kind of start picking up if I have a big area I need to take it off of. And I just kind of twist my kneaded eraser around to pick it up. And so you see it lifted that up. And then if I needed to do like cut out an edge of an object, um, then that's where I was talking about you can take the eraser and create some like points and start to make some lines like this. And it might be something that you have to do over and over um, depending on how light of a line you want. So definitely experiment with some different mark making techniques for that. Um, and I think I'd like to move on to our composition that we'll be working with. And I put a bunch of um, uh, visual aids in that mix post that you can check out. And it looks like Lee dropped the link to that post in the chat if you need a quick link to it. Um, but another one that would be good for like negative space is this one. And we can go back to that if anyone has more questions about negative space, although it might become more obvious once we start the composition. And then I did include a bunch of like fall vibe pictures. Um, and some of them line up with the uh, Art Snacks ink challenge, uh, which I know that this isn't ink, but maybe you could incorporate ink later 
or if you're doing a pastel challenge, you can use these. Uh, but I'm going to be using this one to start out with. These pumpkins by a windowsill. And something that you want to think about when you're picking a reference image or creating a still life, you want to have a really strong light source. Um, so this strong light source is coming from this window and it's creating really defined shadows um, on the pumpkins. So if you've found yourself wanting to draw from life or draw from a, a photo reference and you're having trouble, um, it might be the photo you're trying to draw from. Like I would definitely not start with um, like a photo, like a random photo from your phone. Like you need to be intentional about getting one with a good light source um, to practice these techniques. Um, if you are having trouble, which I did with these photos before I posted them was I put a black and white filter on them. And then I also bumped up the contrast a bunch to make that more exaggerated. So it's easier to see the difference between the lights and darks. Um, so it's just a little tip for using a photo reference. So the first thing I'm going to do to start this composition is to just make a big block of uh, purple with of the pan pastel. And you can use any color you want. Um, you can also use graphite or charcoal. Um, you can use a stick pastel to fill this in. Um, I chose the purple instead of the yellow or the green because it is the deepest color in the color palette we got. And so I think it's just going to show off the value scale the best, but you can really use any color for this technique. And we're just looking for a square um, and it will take a little bit of time to get a nice even swatch. And I wouldn't worry about it getting it completely perfect. Um, but you want it even enough to get started. Uh, something also you could do is if you want really clean edges, you can tape off the edge of your paper for this, but it's definitely not necessary. All right, so. I think the prompt today for the ink challenge is sweaters, if I'm correct. And then tomorrow's is like glass vials or jars. Um, and so I did, if you look in the photo reference pictures, I do have ones with coffee cups, which I think would be close enough. Um, and, and then I do have a picture of a sweater in there as well. But if this, this one's just going for fall. And I talked about this a little bit last time, but it's best to think of your pan pastel as like a dollop of paint and not like an eyeshadow. So you want to think about it more like dipping this tool and kind of tapping it or just dipping it once into the pan and then uh, and not rubbing it around because you're going to create a lot of dust like that um, and maybe pick up too much product. Um, and it's better to work a little bit at a time. All right, almost done filling this in. And I have all my strokes going diagonal. It doesn't really matter. Uh, 
Okay. So there we go. Filled in our solid block of color. And then now Thanks. you shouldn't need to pick up your uh, tool, your applicator for a while, because we're just going to be working with the eraser. So I'm clean, giving mine a good clean. So I'm just massaging it between my hands, pushing it out. And basically what this is doing is just kind of uh, letting the eraser absorb the powder on the outside and kind of mixing it in. And your eraser will get less tacky over time, the more it kind of gets like filled up with graphite or pastel or whatever you're using with it. But um, the eraser that came in your box should last you a good long time before it gets there. Um, so now you'll kind of want be able to understand why we talked about that negative space. And I'll just bring that up again really quick. Um, because you're to when you start removing um, the light areas, it's kind of it's making your brain work backwards because we're used to drawing in a dark area, not removing the light area. So it's like we're used to ignoring the the light area as we draw. Um, and so now we're going to have to kind of turn our brains around and think about this a little bit differently and, so instead of kind of drawing out where the pumpkins are, we're going to be removing this white space here in the back and thinking about this shape, this kind of uh, rectangle with a little chunk in it in the back. So that is the negative space of the composition. And it's also the light lighter area. And it certainly will depend on, you know, your um, your reference and the composition and the value scale behind it. Because down here is also the negative space, but it's darker. So we wouldn't, we won't, we'll be keeping that part. And I wouldn't worry too much about making this all the way light right now. Right now, we're just kind of sketching. We're just kind of blocking out where it's lighter. And remember that if you make a mistake, you can go back and add in uh, more pastel, but I would try to not do that until you're further along in the composition um, and see how it really works out. I know that I don't, I feel like it's said a lot that like, oh, like artist pencils don't have erasers, like real artists don't erase. And like, that's, I feel like that's kind of a myth. <laughs> Um, but I do feel like erasers can like slow you down. So definitely don't reach for one right away. Try to see how far you can get, even if you made a mistake, and then go back later to correct like a really big error instead of just like starting and stopping over and over again. So right now I'm just blocking out these light areas in the back. Of, and I'm and I'm not worried about these windows. This to me, that's all extra. If I want to go like super, you know, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? If I want to be like super authentic to the the media I'm using, but I'm mostly just thinking about that as a big white area in the composition. Right. And there's some little details down here uh, with like this dark black line and then a really white area and then a dark again. So to carve out that really white area, I did make 
my kneaded eraser like to a point so I can really carve that area out. And then I want to remove some right below it, but not too much because that's more of a mid-tone right underneath. And you can kind of start to see the composition coming together. So now we're going to be looking at the shadows in uh, like uh, down around the pumpkin. So we have some lighter area, mid-tone, it's super dark here, another light area, and another light area. So that is where I'm looking right now. And again, it's kind of making you have to look at things a little bit different and carving out that negative space. Something I like about reduction techniques is that um, with something, especially with like a soft charcoal or like these pastels, is that it's going to, it gives you a very, very soft look to your drawing. Um, it's a little bit more moodier. Um, and with drawing um, directly with like a, charcoal stick or something like that can make it look a lot more like rigid sometimes. Just working on that lighter area here. And I would, I would focus mostly on kind of blocking out this area um, and not try to get, uh, if you don't get the tones and everything exactly right on the first go, I think that's great um, because sometimes it's better just to do things gradually and keep going back to remove um, the media because sometimes you can get a little carried away with mo removing too much at once. All right. And there are a couple other pictures I included that had some um, jack-o'-lanterns on it too. And that would be a fun one to try. Because also, if you think about it, a jack-o'-lantern is also kind of a reduction technique where you're removing the part of the pumpkin that you want to light up that's going to be the lighter area. So I'm just going back kind of cleaning up this area before I start the pumpkins. And probably the hardest part, at least that I found in my practice of this too, is making sure to leave enough of the pastel for the dark stumps of the pumpkin, which is harder to find like a block out because that's a smaller detail of the pumpkin. But again, you can always go back and add some if maybe you took off too much there. So I'm going to try to leave 
just the perfect amount. And I'm just kind of stamping my kneaded eraser to sketch out a little bit. So you can see I like create a very, very small little guideline for myself. Um, and I know that's kind of, might be hard to see. Let that focus up. There we go. If I pull it away too fast, it like doesn't focus. There we go. Um, and so I'm just kind of stamping the kneaded eraser to start to remove some of this light area. And always looking at my reference every step of the way. I wouldn't worry too much about the lines on the pumpkin um, right now. Just focus on these like lighter parts here. Also, I didn't mention that the size of paper I'm working on is exactly a half sheet of the Fabriano paper that we um, got in the fall box. And it's a really good size to start with this technique because um, it doesn't take too long to lay down the uh, background. And it also, like, reduction is a technique that can take some time. Um, and I think it's more satisfying to work on something that you're going to get a little bit further along in than maybe to start with a really big piece. So definitely start small. You could start even smaller than this too. Cut this in half and work on a little half sheet or quarter sheet. Um, I remember being in drawing class in school and we would work on like a full like 18 by 24 reduction drawing. <laughs> and man, that takes some time. I almost got some like uh, found some pictures of some like, like skeleton type things. I don't know what it is, but it's like when you're in drawing class, there's always a skeleton in your skill still life. I don't know if everyone else had that experience, but I know it's probably for like learning anatomy and stuff, but we always had ones in ours. And we did this really cool, I, I can't, I don't think it was our reduction lesson, but one of the cool setups we had in our drawing room was um, we had some light tables and my professor one time set up a composition that was, com or a still life, sorry, that was completely on top of the light tables so everything was lit from behind instead of like this where it's like lit from the side um and it was really to practice the technique of following your light source and how that changes how objects can look and um it was pretty cool All right, now I'm gonna go and start to add, like try to add a little bit of the, make it look like it has the lines of the pumpkin. So 
So here, it's going to be a little bit like that. I'm trying not to remove too much because I don't want to make it look that dramatic. Maybe that maybe that one was a little too much. But it will be good if I have some areas I need to go back in and add some because then I can show you guys how to do that. one. So we can see a little bit of a variance there on that. And then I am looking and it looks like you can kind of see that there's a slight difference between the edge of the, you can like see the edge of this pumpkin. So I'm going to try to carve that out a little bit more. And then maybe blend that in a little bit. too bad. Okay. Now let's go in and clean some things up. It's interesting having this screen um, like in front of me because something that's really good to do while you're drawing is to keep backing up from it and looking at it from further away and so every time I lift my head it's like an automatic um, looking at it from further away view um, so if you see me doing that that's what I'm doing and it's really just to check the overall um, value scale and how I'm how I'm doing with that so um, so I'm going to go back and correct a couple things right now and I'm using my tiny little, um, like a, almost like a makeup brush that we got in a tiny little sponge for the pan pastels. And like I said, make sure not to like really rub the brush around in there uh, or the sponge. Uh, you just kind of want to dip it in and you'll get plenty on, on the end of that. Um, so if you see right here, I kind of lost my shadow that I was supposed to have. I removed a little bit too much. So I'm just going to go back in and start working that back in. And I'm going to try to do it gradually. We can kind of clean up any shapes that I was a little bit off on, but doesn't have to be perfect. You definitely will be able to tell that they're pumpkins. And I know I talked, if you were at my last class, I talked about how I am not the kind of person that draws a lot from my head. I like using a photo reference. I like working with still life or um, drawing from life. Being in person and drawing is probably my preferred method. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. That's, that has always been my preferred way to draw. And so, yeah, if you've ever, I know that with social media and stuff and artists, it probably just seems like, wow, how do they, how do they do all that without, um, you know, any guidance or using any 
template or something. And it's not all artists do that. And so you don't have to feel bad about using a photo reference or anything. I feel like sometimes it's like I would sit down and maybe like to challenge myself by making things more difficult um, as like an exercise, but it's certainly not necessary for um, your everyday art practices. Okay, so I'm just tapping in some more here on the bottom and you could probably see that motion that I'm doing. I'm not rubbing it as much up. Um, so I'm just trying to build in that darker value here right at the bottom. And yeah, that's starting to look a lot better. I'm looking at a couple other areas that probably need a little bit more. I'm going to sharpen up this window pane thing here. And if you can see, it's like a really dark color. Hey, Kaylin, this is Lee. Uh, it's looking really good. And we're about halfway through this screen. All right, great. Sounds awesome. I'm curious if you guys are following along, um, if you are using this pumpkin picture or if you chose a different picture to follow. And you can let me know how that's going or if you have any questions at all about this technique or um, anything else you see me doing, feel free to drop them into the chat and Lee will read me the questions and I can answer them while I'm working. So definitely let me know if you have any questions. All right, so I sharpened those up a bit and now I think I wanna put a little bit more on the stumps because if you look at this picture and you say, where, where is the darkest point of the picture? Your eyes immediately go to the stumps because not only are they one of the darkest places in the picture, but they're also in the center of the picture. Uh, so we want to make sure that we're really capturing that focal point. I'm also, I'm not capturing every single detail of these pumpkins like there's little highlights here on the stem and other little uh I don't know texture on the pumpkins there's the windows in the background and really just start simple and then you can always go back in and add that texture or the details later um, and it's amazing how much will come across in your drawing when you aren't as focused on some small details like that. Um, and you think you need to like include everything like that and you'll still, it'll still look like a pumpkin when you're done. So, okay, that looks so much better. Um, trying to see if there's anything else. I think I am just gonna darken up this area right down here before I go back with my eraser. This is a very harsh line here. Right. Okay. I think that's all I want to do right now with adding that in. And so now I'm going to go back and clean up some more of the lighter areas with my eraser. So I'm going to go back and really make this line a lot harsher and carve out this square, the, the squareness of the window. Um, the media itself will still kind of retain a softness with the drawing. So you can 
don't be afraid to kind of use some hard edges. And this is very, very light in the background. Right. Something we'll get into in just a little bit is I have one of these that is mostly complete of the same composition. And we can dig into that and experiment with adding another color of the pan pastel into the lighter areas of the composition. And I think it could look really cool. Um, my last class, I talked a little bit about color theory and which colors are naturally go forward or naturally pull backward. Um, and so if you're using the pan pastel palette from the box we got and only have those colors, your purple one is going to be the one that falls back the most into space. So it's going to look like it's the furthest away. And I actually, I'm thinking about <laughs> next class. I have a little, um, one of my color theory projects that I had to do um, where it really illustrates how colors move in space. And so maybe I need to whip that out. But um, the yellow that we got is definitely going to be the one that pulls forward the most. It's going to look the closest to you. So it'll be interesting. Uh, so same with like the dark part is the part that looks the furthest away and the light part is the part that looks closer. Um, and so that is something you can experiment with the limited color palette that we have. Um, and so we can try adding in some yellow into those light areas and see how that works out. And there's lots of other things that play into uh, space and how to make like areas look like they're in the background and not the foreground. Um, color is one of those areas, but it's not the only thing. So in this photo, you can see things are going to look a lot sharper in the front. So things are going to not look quite as sharp in the background, less defined. Um, and if you're only working with uh, like marker or something like that, in that case, uh, you know, trying to make something look fuzzier is a little bit more difficult because marker is a pretty harsh media. Um, and so you want to play with line width. So line width is going to be a lot darker the closer something is to you, and it's going to be a lot thinner the further something is away from you. But I love... I love talking about stuff like this. So if you have any questions about color theory and how colors move in space and different elements of design, definitely let me know. I think my color theory project I'm thinking of is where we had, you had to use like seven or nine colors and then you had to paint them on a black background. And when you turned it in, your professor had to easily tell like what order they should have gone in in closest to furthest away. And so um, you would label them like on the back, you know, what number from one to whatever, seven or nine they were. And it, that had to be very obvious to the viewer. So it's pretty fun. Definitely teaches you a lot about color. Okay, going back in, just continuing to 
just carve out the details of this piece. And I had gone in and added a lot of color back in here. And now I don't quite need all of it. So I'm going to be removing a little bit of it. only want to keep what I need. So you can see I am carved out this little shape here. So I'm still thinking about my negative space and being like, okay, it needs to be like a rectangle with a little, you know, circle cut out of it. And that's what I'm thinking about instead of thinking about, okay, I just need to like draw the pumpkin. Okay, and then I need to kind of soften up these edges of the shadow. And at the beginning class, we talked about how to get a mid-tone with these pastels and leaving some of the pastel on the tip of your eraser. Um, kind of is allows you to kind of use it as a smudger a little bit and just going to smudge that around and then I need to focus on now I want to do the same thing I just did over here where I carved out that nice lighter space and I want to make sure I get the same thing here and I have a little bit of it but we're just going to make it a little bit more dramatic so first I'm just going to make sure that I'm going to go slow, make sure that I get the shape right. Oops. That's looking really nice. Right. And then I want to come up and clean this up a little bit around here. Cause it looking it's looking like my pumpkin is not quite the right shape right here. It looks like it kind of juts out. So I want to fix that. And it's pretty light on this side of the pumpkin, so I can take away a pretty decent amount of this dark area. And then I also want to take a little bit out of here, and I think I want to take a little bit more on this windowsill area. Put in a little bit more. And that's making the shape of the pumpkin look a lot more like a pumpkin. All right. And so there's a couple things I want to do now that I've gotten this far. And so th things I'm going to think about here are how this light area of the pumpkin is really close to the background and mine still kind of has a harsh line there. So we want to like still have some harsh lines going on and I want to try to clean all of those up a bit. Uh, but there were all areas I was kind of afraid to remove too much at the beginning. Um, and now I'm just kind of going back and cleaning those up. And I also want to probably exaggerate those lines on the pumpkin a little bit more to make them look a little bit more pumpkin-y. So I know this like feels weird, but it's like you almost need to completely remove that edge of the pumpkin because it's like it completely disappears. That is just how this looks. You can always go back and add some if you need to. And 
and let's see here. Moving that harsh line I had. over on that side. And then again, let's just fix this little area right here. It kind of looks like it's jutting out again. And then can also lighten up a little bit of that area on the window because it's not quite as dark as the pumpkin. Talking about this area right here. And so I'm just tapping the eraser over that area because I don't want to take too much off. All right, so that's looking good there. I'm going to go back and then add a little bit more of my lines of the pumpkin. And this, I think this is probably the hardest part is to carve out just enough that you can see the lines on the pumpkin, but not too much that you um, are changing the shadows and stuff too much. So definitely go slowly if you need to. And if you feel more comfortable, you can always use your uh, little uh, sponge to kind of help you blend some areas, which like maybe I'll do. I'll see if I want to do that. Okay, and all right. Just continuing to look at my reference photo to see where I need to keep pulling color from. And I was looking up here. It's pretty light up here, but I also feel like I did not blend that as much as I want to. So I'm just going to go through with my sponge and blend this up a little bit. And maybe even add some because this is really dark here. And this one looks really similar to the one in the picture, but this one is a little bit less um dark here where it needs to be so i'm just gonna go and add some more down at the bottom and really try to create that same value pattern it has over the pumpkin without trying to change too much the work i've already done Gonna look here to see. Where I have some darker areas that I maybe missed. And 
All right. Okay. Well, that's not too bad. Might have added a little bit too much up here. See, and this is one of the tricky parts about going back in and adding or whenever you're like drawing and erasing is you don't want to get into a rhythm where you're constantly just like drawing and erasing um, cause that can slow you down like when you're just trying to get things looking perfect so definitely be okay with a I don't know less than perfect less and don't worry about being too too precise with everything sometimes it's better to get it looking pretty good and then move on to another part of your drawing and then come back to it later. Well, cool. okay. Well, I'm going to set this one over here area where you can still see it. And then this is the one I had done before class. It's a little different. My mark making is a little different, a little more expressive in this one. Um, and I wanted to go in and use one of the other colors from our set. So if you didn't know this, you can take the caps off of your pan pastels and stack them like the bottom of the case is a lid as well so um, definitely save your lids I just like stored them in my studio um, in case I ever just want to bring one with me somewhere um, but it's really great for um, keeping them all together um, and I'm gonna uh, clean off my little sponge and you can just do that on a paper towel I'm gonna move this out of the way I'm just cleaning this off real quick. Um, and there's lots of tips and trip, tricks for cleaning the applicator um, on that little guide that came in the box uh, of the pan pastels. Um, but if you happen to lose that on the pan pastel website, they also have like little blog tutorial things on um, how to clean that off. So. What I want to do now is take the yellow into those lighter areas and then let my paper color be more of a mid-tone. So the yellow is basically my white, um, if that makes sense. And so I'm just going to go in and I'm first only going to do this on the pumpkins uh, and not the background because I want to see how it will look with only putting some on the pumpkins. And I'm just working in those lighter areas that I already had carved out. And it's okay if you're not too precise because you do want some areas where the paper is showing through because that is also part of your value scale is the color of the paper since it is toned. And the value of your paper will probably vary depending on what color you got. Like this tan one is definitely a mid-tone, but if you have the stone one, that's going to pull a lot more forward. So um, you'll just have to test out um, how your paper is playing into that. And I kind of love how this is looking orange with the other colors around it. It's definitely making it look more pumpkin-y, which is pretty fun. Uh, it's really cool to see like how colors react to colors around them. And I think with the undertones in this paper being a little bit more, you know, brown, warm, and the yellow being more of a golden yellow, it's definitely letting this look really orange. And I'm trying not to mix uh, the color too much because I want this like bright, bright yellow in some areas. 
So I'm kind of just tapping it on to the top. And then I'll go in and mix it together a little bit. Might have over deposited the color there, got a little carried away. That's okay. It's funny because on um, it's looking really strong to me in person, but when I look at it um, on my screen in front of me from further away, it's definitely looking really good. Um, and so that's always kind of the test. Sometimes, you know, looking at your drawing really close up is sometimes uh, hurt hurts you <laughs> in your drawing. Um, and you think something looks bad when it really doesn't. So I'll, to back up, you can just pick it up and hold it away from you or whatever you got to do. This is really fun. I really like how these colors are working together. These are also like nearly what a uh, perfect um, complements a purple and then a yellow. So, um, so that's also really fun. Add in a little bit down here, side of the pumpkin. These are so pigmented that like I'm using them with the purple and like if this was paint, uh, the purple paint would basically just eat the yellow paint and you would hardly even be able to see it with um by using such a small amount, but these pastels are so pigmented that um, like you can really see the yellow in that shadowy area. But it also tells me I need to be careful and light handed with this. Yeah, and I would also love to see one where um, you could remove color with reduction and then go in with some of the colored pencils as well would be really fun. I think I'm just going to stick to the pan pastels today. Um, and remember that this technique can also be used with graphite. Um, so you can use your pencils to color in a you know a large section like this and then remove it um, with an eraser um, and you'll you'll get a really similar effect I would definitely do that practice value scale that we did earlier in class because graphite's going to behave a lot different than these pan pastels I find that graphite doesn't can be like a bit stickier I guess. Um, and so you want to make sure you know how it's going to behave um, to get all of the tones that you want. I'm just gradually working this in. Even feel like I need to go in and actually add some more purple to some areas. And adding a little bit to the stump. I guess I could probably put green on the stump, but uh, I don't want to get I don't want to get too carried away. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna just clean up a few areas here. The eraser. 
And I also left like a lot more of my background when I was doing this piece beforehand, um, which I kind of like. It gives it more of a vignette than like this one, but it's always fun to like just really recreate something from a photo. Um, and all of the photos I included on that article post are have really great compositions with very clear darks and lights to play with. Um, so definitely if the pumpkins weren't your thing or you just want to practice more, um, definitely look at that um, article post to get some other ideas. I'm now going back in with the purple and darkening up this area at the base of the pumpkins. And if you're having trouble, like really achieving a very, very dark area in this composition, like go ahead and go in with the graphite pencils just in the shadows and you can like darken and sharpen um, those areas up. All right. And that is looking, to me, that looks so much better. So I'm going to go ahead and do the same thing here and add back in some purple right in this area. But I really love, like, the two-toned color in this. It's really fun. It was something I knew would look good, but I was, like, waiting for the stream to do, like, the reveal even for myself of how the, the two colors look. Um, but yep, it looks just as good as I pictured it in my head. Okay. Doing a little mixing of the purple and yellow. Okay, and um, that is looking very nice. I think I want to take this color down and just a little bit more and do some mixing here. Um, yeah, that is looking really good. So I'm kind of going to go over a few things that we talked about now that we're getting towards the end of class and I'm almost done with these compositions, but just wanted to go over our initial still life, which this would be a really fun one, just like even picking one of these and uh, carving out that negative space around and completing the value scale on one of these tokens would be such a great starting place if you don't want to dive into something like more photorealistic with like um, the other ones. So it would be a great one to look at for uh, negative space and just practicing value scale. Um, and then one I really like um, that we didn't there's a lot in here. Again, I threw, these I found all on like a free photo website, um, but I also threw them into um, Photoshop and I put a black and white filter on them and I pumped up the contrast. And even within the black, like not all black and whites are created the same. Like some, like the, you can like pick to really focus on midtones or highlights and the reds and the greens, whatever. And so um, I fine tuned each one so that they have a really great value scale to work with. So like, this is probably the one I would go to next after this pumpkin one. Um, Cause again, I think the texture of the cloth background is um, really great for this technique and it looks really soft. And that's how these, um, pastels look. Um, so yeah, definitely go and check out um, that post if you want any of these pictures. Um, 
And um, then if you're going to be diving in to a reduction composition, don't forget to test out a value scale on your paper um, and create a nice gradient from dark to light using the eraser that you're going to be using in your composition. And I would play around with different erasers. Um, I used the kneaded eraser that came in the fall box, um, but you can definitely try out what kinds of um, line variations you're going to get with different erasers. So definitely play around with that. And yeah, I think it's about time to move on if anyone had any questions or would like to put um, into chat what they're they were working on or yeah. Yeah, thanks, Galen. I, I think this was awesome. Uh, techniques were fantastic. And I think the reference photo was excellent and timely uh, fall season. So that's wonderful. We have a few people here, Jackie and Sarah, if you have any comments, questions, um, thoughts or feelings, feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, if not, totally fine. Um, I'll give you another moment there and then I'm going to replace the spotlight so we can see Caitlin. Hey, Caitlin. Hello. Um, but that was a great session. Uh, and Caitlin, why don't you sign off? What are we doing next time? Oh man, next time. So we're like, we're not having another live stream until, um, November. And mm. so I think that's actually going to give us a lot of time. If you all want to, um, post some suggestions to me about what you want to learn and mix, I'm really excited about what you guys are learning about these materials and if you've come across a technique that has been hard for you to get through or you don't understand um so um i haven't exactly nailed out what we're doing this time um but it's about a month from now or actually a little bit over a month so um definitely um let me know if um there are any techniques i definitely want to we've done a lot with the pastels the lot last two sessions um so i want to dive in a little bit more with the mechanical colored pencils um and yeah so definitely let me know if there's something there with Great. Um, that material yeah fantastic all right thanks everyone for joining us live